Welcome to the AM Part Material and Machine Certification Strategies panel session. My name is Kate Hyam. I'm a Project Engineering Manager here at ASME in the Standards and Certification Department. My current projects support standards development and events in the areas of big data, manufacturing, and advanced manufacturing, along with verification and validation of computer modeling. And I'll be the moderator for this session. Our panelists today are Jesse Boyer, Fellow of Additive Manufacturing at Pratt & Whitney. As part of the Process Control Center for Additive Manufacturing at Raytheon Technologies, he is a technical lead for the development, implementation, and manufacturing effort to bring metal additive parts into production. Rick Russell is a NASA Technical Fellow for Materials at the NASA Engineering and Safety Center at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And Marcin Bauza is the Vice President of New Technology and Innovation at Zeiss. He is responsible for the international business development, defining, defining market strategy, and value preposition for emerging and existing technologies. He is also head of Zeiss Additive Manufacturing Process and Control. Marcin, as our, as our session sponsor, has a few words to share. Marcin. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I uh, would like to just give a quick overview about uh, who Zeiss is. Um, we are an international corporation with uh, headquarters in Germany. We have been um, in the business for 175 years now. And we be part of uh, many uh, big events. Um, uh, since we have uh, Rick here and NASA, I, I could uh, remind everyone we had a 50-year anniversary of landing on the moon. And all the pictures uh, from the Apollo mission have been actually taken with the Zeiss Optics. Uh, we're also very heavily involved in the semiconductor. Today, the latest technology uh, that is um, used for processor and graphic cards uh, production is using Zeiss advancements. We also um, the advance in optical and uh, medical technologies. But here for additive manufacturing, um, the key uh, is to advance additive manufacturing to the level that can be used on a daily basis and can be really used in production. And that's where Zeiss is uh, putting a lot of effort. Uh, we're combining a lot of technologies um, together to um, enable this process and to um, uh, speed up uh, those capabilities. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marcin. And now we'll begin our panel questions. At this time, I'd like to remind you to please use the chat box to add your questions so that hopefully we can get them answered at the end of the pre-prepared questions. Our first question is, how do certification strategies differ by implementation? And I'll hand this over to Rick to answer first. Great. Um, so uh, as NASA, we are a, a certifying body. Um, obviously, for, for for space applications, and so really, really, we have two factors that we look at when it comes into comes to um, uh, certification strategies. The first would be risk, and the second would be um, uh, consequence of failure. So, so, so the, uh, we, we are currently finalizing some of our uh, new NASA standards, and and and, we're, and and so we cut it into what type of mission are you flying? Is it a crewed mission? Like you know, man's you know, men going to the space station, or 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 or, or men or women going to, to to the moon, for example. Um, is it a non-crewed application, which could be your deep space satellite, or it could be your low Earth orbit satellites, et cetera, or could it be aeronautics, which is NASA aeronautics, which is more of your research aircraft. And so your requirements for additive are going to be changed based on that. And then when it comes to consequence of failure, that's more of your individual part. If we look at your individual part. We're going to look at um, how bad is it. Well, how bad of a day is it if this particular part fails? So our, our 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 new standards that are coming out have A, B, or C as your three different um, levels of, uh, of of consequence of failure, and and what and what that affects is um, your certification strategies. So, you know how you know the process control requirements, the testing requirements, et cetera, that go along with that part. Okay, can we hear from Jesse? Would you like to take that question? Um, sure. So at Pratt, we look at both the application uh, for additive uh, in the form of use cases and the overall additive manufacturing process. Uh, for the AM process, we break it down into materials, uh, the application of the component, and the overall manufacturing process, including additive. Uh, so it's front to back. Um, so for each of our use cases, our certification approach may differ slightly. Um, and our use cases are uh, basically part substitution, repair, 
Uh, this is where we leverage existing conventional designs and we do minimum changes. Uh, the most significant would be if we did a possible material change. Uh, and that's uh, to ideally implement an in interchangeable part within the uh, current uh, pro uh, product. Um, this one's a little bit more part and process focused. Uh, if there is a material change, then we usually have to check that material, uh, the AM material to ensure that the material properties are adequate. Uh, the next one is basically unitization. It's where we take a look at com a combination of multiple parts with minimal design changes. And this one is uh, more material and part focused. Um, the other one is uh, sustainment. Uh, so here we're looking at uh, the replacement or repair of fielded parts. And because of that, we're very, uh, we're a lot more machine uh, and, and uh, part focused on that one to make sure that our, uh, the new design or the, the replacement design will fit the, uh, the current uh, requirements. And the last use case is optimization. And this is where we fully leverage AM design freedoms, a new material complex design, usually more of a complex design. Uh, and this one is more part and material focused, but also includes the process, right? So that one there is probably our most difficult one to uh, actually go and certify. Uh, but regardless of the application, all of our certification is encompassed in our technology readiness and our manufacturing uh, and manufacturing readiness technology or methodologies. Okay, thank you, Marcin. So uh, Zeiss in this regard is um, more a provider of a technology to allow the certification process. So um, looking at the uh, holistic process of additive manufacturing, we realized that, um, as Jesse mentioned, there is a lot of connectivity to existing processes, like subtractive, and um, we need to provide a, a process workflows and seamless ability to understand what's the quality of the powder, how this quality will affect the part print, how does the printing process itself will influence the part. So to open a door for possibility of rather closing, um, having a very strict uh, rules of how the part is being printed and printing many, many times the same part on the same machine to verify that this machine is okay, to be, or to be more uh, capable of printing based on what we have, understanding the parameters, how those parameters have to be set, and then uh, allow the, uh, ensure the high quality part for, um, to advance this, um, Zeiss have started together with uh, Oak Ridge, uh, a special CRADA program at Knoxville, Tennessee, where we have built a complete chain of uh, technology to enable this type of uh, assessment. So starting from powder to really understand what have happens and uh, finishing uh, the part with, with every single step. Um. Okay. Uh, to, as a follow on to that question, how do certification strategies for additive manufacturers differ from other subtractive processes? And I'd like to first direct this to Jesse. Sure. Um, so for us, you know, currently the overall process is very similar. Like I said, we, we utilize our technology readiness and our manufacturing readiness methodologies. Um, the, the big difference is we don't typically have the 10 to 20 plus years of process and material understanding that we do with the conventional processes. So it, it, at this time, it's basically we're developing the material, the process, and the part simultaneously. Um, also, given that there's a large amount of digital data available, um, we tend to set the understanding bar relatively high compared to legacy applications. Um, and then what that drives us to be is is initially conservative on the capabilities, right? We can we can go look at uh, much more detailed information than we probably did in in the past when we looked at our, our conventional processes. Um, so in general, um, it, we still follow the rigor of our our, our subtractive or our conventional processes, um, but we're trying to figure out how can we do that much more efficiently. Um, how can we leverage those large am amounts of digital data, and how can we maintain the rigor that we had and the expectations that we have for for our conventional processes. Okay, thank you. And and Rick, could you share with us what you do at NASA? Uh, sure. So so um, so for, for for additive, you know, one of the things that we we like to stress that you know each additive build is really its own foundry. So when you're so so it's so if you want to put castings as as your traditional process here. And, and really, the, uh, looking at our process, the governing principles that we're looking at is first understanding and appreciation of what this AM process is and what kind of part it's going to produce. Um, and then to integrating that across um, 
the multi-disciplines that are involved uh, throughout the process of building that part. So your designing engineers, your materials engineers, your your inspectors and users and everything. Um, and then the third is to really define and follow the plan that you put together. So we're so 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 as far as a plan, um, you know, for each part, we really we really feel that the the first step is is having qualified materials. So we have a, a rigorous uh, protocol for 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 how to qualify that material on that particular additive machine um, or similar machines, um, and then once you have that qualified material, then then we we want to be able to bathe that with uh, statistical process control. Um, so we you know the, one thing that that additive needs is is consistency. So we need to have those parts. Um, statistically controlled and then once you have all that it builds into your, your 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 what we call the material property suite which is akin to your design allowable for that part and all that leads up to your um the qualified material and the quali and, and with, with statistical process control with properties understand you, you you need to qualify that part process make a plan and stick to it thank you and marcy um I think um, I, I like the analogy that Rick brought of uh, a foundry. Um, I, I say that uh, with respect to subtractive processes, um, where engineers are used to uh, pick a material, they know what the standard says, they know what the specification of the material are, and they drive uh, the entire post process, like heat treatment and everything, based on those values. In additive, that's just the opposite. You you simply bringing the foundry into the process itself. So it's a very critical to understand what have, what was created. And now, when we think about it from one perspective, okay, it's a, it's a headache is to create a consistency from additive process. I would try to flip it and put it this way. It is an opportunity because now we have a chance to create a parts that have a multiple material properties within one part. There are uh, there is work already in the publications done by Oak Ridge showing uh, DOE letters, for example, printed with different crystallographic structures in the same part. That opens the doors for a whole new level of advancements in, in engineering and manufacturing um, of those parts. So, so in our case, we're trying to make this as simple as possible to do those analysis and as fast as possible. So, uh, the statistical control, as important as is could also lead to 100% control if needed. Uh, a good example is uh, CT scans in the past would take hours and today it may take minutes or even seconds. And those are advancements that allow uh, the 100% uh, the check if someone really have a critical parts that they wanna make sure there's no chance there is an issue. Okay, thank you. Um, so what do we need to do to get there? What do we need to do to um, achieve certification. Um, I think maybe back to you, Marcin, to give us a little bit more insight on that. Um, because the material is created during the printing process, and um, if you think about a printing process, depends how we set the scan strategy, depends how we set this heat, and, uh, and a lot of those parameters, you can create a very different part. So it is very difficult to follow the I call it subtractive processes standards where you define the process, the batch process very well, and the foundry follows step by step. Here we need to really, I think, define the steps that are required for every um, individual or, or the user of this technology to make a certain uh, activities or tests to verify, okay, if I want to do the heat treatment, I need to know what I'm starting with, what kind of grains do I have, how they look, etc. And if someone follows that process, that will open a door for one way really controlling the output, but on the other end, opens a door for new materials creation. Because one of the things that additive really enables us today is I understand that might be very fearful for, for some of aerospace. We really can create a new materials, much easier materials with a whole new uh, perspectives. I already see materials that are possible to be created in additive and laser sintering versus they are not possible, the same combinations to be created in a bulk uh, material. So I, I, I think the, added, the, the certification have to really 
change the way how it approaches uh, how it approaches the the process. Okay. I'd like to hand this question over to Jesse and also ask um, what standards are you currently using or, or what standards will be needed in this area in addition to your thoughts on how, what do we need to get there? Get this. Yep. Um, so yeah, those are good, good questions there too. Um, so I guess I'll start with um, just saying that the regulatory requirements uh, for us require just as much detail as the technical challenges. And, and actually this panel is great because, you know, me and the situation I am in as a, as a provider of parts, right? I need to, re, I need to rely on my, my regulatory body as well as folks like Zeiss, right? That can bring uh, solutions to the table for certification. Um, so it really starts with a good relationship with that regulatory body and the customer as well as um, the people supplying the process. And it's really critical to fully understand all those requirements and expectations. Um, material purification is a little bit more straightforward, you know, at least right now, traditionally, right? We know what we need to do. We know how many samples we have to do, things like that. Uh, but the process validation needs uh, to ensure that all are focused on the same expectations and potential concerns, right? So whether it's powder reuse, whether it's the overall machine capability, whether it's the, uh, the, the material microstructure, uh, items like that, what is the most important thing that that customer regulatory body is concerned about? And then how do we need to go and measure that or ensure that we meet those that criteria. Um, depending on the application certification, it, it can be very costly and time consuming. Um, and, and so just like what Marcin had said before, right? We need to have the most efficient methods to minimize that cost and time. Um, I think ideally as we gain more process and material understand, understanding for potentially new novel uh, ways uh, that we can do certification in the future, right? So more uh, process-based, more uh, physics-based modeling, things like that. Uh, I think we'll be able to possibly change the way that we do certification. Uh, as well as standards go, um, you know, we do rely on uh, multiple regulatory uh, standards, uh, SDO, Standards Development Organizations right now. Uh, so we do look at uh, standards coming out, ASME, ASTM, as well as SAE. And I will say that I think over the last few years, all those standards development organizations have really stepped up to the plate uh, along with um, with ANSI and looked at the different gaps that are there in the standardization uh, area, and they're trying to close that relatively quickly. Um, so as we as we've come along in our journey, um, uh, there's there's quite a few more standards that are a little bit more detailed, uh, less guides, and and now more standards. And I think as we uh, in the next year, few years, right, we'll be uh, utilizing a lot more of those standards uh, regularly across the industry and not just in small pockets. Thank you. And Rick? So, so, um, so as far as, you know, where do we need to go? I think the first step we need to do is we just need to continue to build our knowledge base. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. You know, uh, uh, we've heard about new, you know, new materials. We've heard about new processes and, uh, you know, uh, and how to build that. So we have to continue to build our database. We have to, because as a regulatory agency, we need to understand the property. So if you're going to have a part with the property's changing from one side of the part to the other. I need to be able to understand how that how that affects the product that that, that we're going to be certifying. Um, and then an, another huge step we need is, is we need to we need to um, continue to build our uh, knowledge base and our and our techniques in inspection. Um, you know we need faster and accurate ways to inspect these parts. So and, and to do it while they're being built. So the institute NDE uh field and and where we're going i think it's uh i'm hoping to make that uh, uh an area of uh, of new emphasis for nasa going forward where we want to be able to um we, we need to be able to inspect these parts that are very very difficult and very very expensive to inspect um, on the standardization role um i agree with jesse that there's a lot of great work going on by all the standards organizations um astm uh, uh as uh, um SAE and the others, um, and, and and there's been some great steps moving forward, closing the gaps. Um, from the NASA point of view, um, we are actually on the verge of releasing uh, our our, our uh, first two additive standards. Uh, the first one is NASA Standard 6030, which is for the crewed crewed vehicles applications, um, and then an accompanying equipment and standardization standard, NASA Standard 6033, which um, by the end of the calendar year 2020, will be fully released. They're 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 they're, they're really close to, to being in the final review review stages, and um, uh, I look forward to those being released um, in the near future. Great. Okay. 
Um, Marcine, did you want to address the standards that you think might be needed in this area or those that are currently being used? I mean, in, in, in general, the way how I see for, for standards, as I mentioned, uh, we need to learn how to address the process steps. If people will follow a certain uh, activity step by step, and that will open the freedom of, of creation, what the additive is really uh, designed for, but also will ensure that what is really uh, created, like uh, mentioned, uh, multi part properties within uh, different locations of the part, etc. That will enable a, a whole different uh, paradigm shift in, in manufacturing. I mean, if we think about it, last 150 years, we've been all focusing on making sure that everything that we make is the same and the same and is the same. And additive is just the opposite to this. Great. <clears throat> Thank you for answering that question. That's a question near and dear to my heart as part of the standards department here. So now we'll take some questions from the audience. 